I think in terms of what next and how do we engage more in this issue as, as feminists from whatever region we're in, I think the devil is in the details. And that's where we're quite weak. And it really is um, the point that Oni had made about getting complex before we simplify. And both the feminist uh, movements and particularly though the climate justice movements as, as Oni pointed out, have really not done that. And so we're still at the point of calling attention to the crisis, which remains critical. Mm. But, you know, what does adaptation mean? What does it imply for us? What is resilience? What does that imply? Um, the way that resourcing is flowing. What does that mean and how do we analyze it? And I know there are people and feminists doing work on this, but, you know, the Green Climate Fund, and as the money comes and as it starts to settle, particularly around our ocean regions, um, both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, the, the way that money is flowing and who's coming, the technologies involved that are really shifting us away from a more revolutionary agenda um, around, around the transformations we need. So I think when it comes to feminist engagement in the climate crisis, it's now we need to shift to that level of complexity and detail to inform then the simplified messaging of the mobilizing. Um, so I think that's where, where it's at and it's a lot of hard work um, to be done because it's moving so fast in our intergovernmental spaces, I know in our region. Just a couple of things on our climate change policy. It's great that we're having a climate change policy. Fiji is definitely gonna be in the region at least one of the first movers on this. And you're right about the moratorium, you know, it's just tenure moratorium on exploration, exploitation, not exploration. We should have that on exploration also. But the moratorium in itself is not enough. You know, it, it doesn't guarantee um, the institutions that are needed, that are linked to deep sea mining. It doesn't give us the, it doesn't guarantee us a robust judicial system where we need to be able to take you know, the, EIA, the violators of the EIAs too. You know, our legislative system is weak. This is where the corporate get away with what they're doing is in the institutions that the moratorium doesn't cover. The moratorium is about science, knowledge, getting the science behind it. It's not addressing the legislative environment that's needed to prosecute those who violate our oceans. Um, it doesn't address things like WIPO and the capture of knowledge. You know, who owns all of that knowledge that the sciences are going to get us on deep sea mining. The moratorium is about halt, stop within the EEZ. It's not saying let's, let's do a moratorium out in the international waters. That's still up for grabs. So while it's good to have that moratorium maybe hidden in the climate change agenda, it's good to see the ocean climate change nexus, you know, at least in the Pacific, be more connected. But there needs to be, like we're saying, a deeper interrogation of the things we're asking for and the language that we're using, it needs to be more complex. And that takes me to the other question about the nuclear free movement campaign versus the climate change campaigns that we're having now. Yes, I think that's where the hope is, that we can see the hope is that it's building, it's coming, um, it's mobilizing the region, you know, there's a response, young people are interested. But again, the climate change needs to be more complex. The language, we need to do that thing where we make it complex first before we make it simple. And I think some of our climate change campaigns are first simple before it's complex. We need to use the language, move beyond language in the climate change campaigns that goes beyond, I don't know, um, ocean pollution, plastic st straws and coffee cups towards saying actual words like capitalism and neoliberalism that at least Pacific climate change activists don't want to say, they don't want to say those words. So whilst there is space, it is about making it complex first before we simplify it and package it. Um, I'll come back to your question another day about fears, intergenerational fears. <laughs> Um, thanks. I actually wanted to take us back to the climate crisis and be really boring and non-script as a Pacific Islander again, um, but, but also linked to, to the very interesting discussions Kumi and Sonia were just having. And I wanted to, I suppose, be a bit boring um, in terms of the, the material. Um, I think it goes back to what you were saying, Anasuya, about how the climate crisis can be a really 
interesting and, and, a, and a critically urgent way to bring together some of these conversations. And I know we were talking about de-democratization, but I really do want to, want to think about how, how you do that in terms of climate crisis because of the importance of the dawn frame. And I think we were paying homage to that on the first day and we've talked about it all throughout. But just, you know, just how critical a voice that is in, in a very urgent debate. Um, you know, I, I, because I think of um, the Blue Economy panel that Oni spoke on and Gita and Maureen contributed to and, and how important that was for bringing together a set of ideas in a particular way, in a particular dawn way, which is so different and just not at all the same as the mainstream climate justice movement or the mainstream um, kind of environmental movement, which, you know, is the louder voice here in this thing and it and misses so much of what's critical. Um, and I just think that I know that Dawn is already doing this work, but just to underline the importance of continuing to explore some of this in the way that you've been doing with Pang, because it informs and equips the rest of us who are not at the center of that, who, who don't have the, the, the understanding across the science to link this, you know, to do this kind of complex interlinked approach, which also brings what's hiding behind science. Like, this is too sciencey for you. This is the domain of the technical experts out of Europe. No, you're, you're, you're hiding stuff. And, there's, and, and, you know, that's some of your work has been in uncovering that. It's a critical tool for the rest of us. It's going to be critical for those of us who are at these sites of engagement, whether it's the fires in Australia and Brazil, whether it's, um, you know, the rising tides in Marshall Islands. So... Yeah, I just want to just want to say that please, you know, let's continue down that path. The victim, victimization, it's really problematic. And and it's the it's the form that the climate movement have adopted. And it's really been problematic. So for us really to try to engage that space again has been a little bit difficult. And so the silence is because we really, I mean, it's been difficult to enter that space to kind of say this whole victim thing is, but it, it serves very particular purposes and agendas. And we are seeing it perpetuated, particularly by the global north and its resources. <coughs> It needs specific elders <coughs> to be victims. And its sustained victimhood is damaging for the kinds of resistance, <coughs> containment resistance to sustain movement formation. So we've been looking at very different ways to address the climate crisis. And the oceans give us a new framework again because it requires us to do historical justice issues, which relates to imagining the imaginations of the ocean, which I didn't want to talk a lot about yesterday. But it's a very useful framework that we've been proactively working since 2010 to develop this, because it allows us to do, do so much more around this whole crisis work that's going on. Um, so that's just one point about why the ocean's framework, the oceanic framework, is such a powerful framework. And I think Dawn has been really good to accompany us, and I feel ready to engage again on the climate work. Um, because we can see all of the links to all of these areas that we're talking about here. For me, I think in many ways, one of the most critical things Dawn gave me was a really early view into the climate crisis, and that was because of the Pacific Islander Dons, right? <coughs> In 2003, all of you from the Pacific Islands were talking about the climate crisis, and we were thinking about it, and Dawn was theorizing about it. And that... Um, that foresight, in a way, has not been shared with the world. And it continues to be or shared, but not amplified, let's say. 
And it continues to be something that I think could be a way to, to do some of that proactive work, though it's, it's still reactive, but analytically proactive that incorporates all of these complexities based on the context. I mean, every one of these questions can be looked at through that lens. And so I'm just trying to sit with that and see what that means and what that could imply for both analytical frames and um, analytical energies. I am very intrigued by the idea of a dialogue, opening a dialogue with the teenagers <coughs> on this. As feminists, what is it that we have to learn from you? And what might you learn from us about, and maybe you shouldn't learn anything from us, but whatever it is, um, um, that there could be something there that could be exciting. Um, and Peggy's paying no attention at all, but this is... I'm writing it down. Oh, down. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Peggy. <laughs> um, but you were looking, so I thought, oh, what's Peggy doing there? Because She's I was talking. She's taking notes. Wonderful. Because, and I did that because, because I was talking about the teenagers. Yeah. And I know that that's something you would, um, you would get excited about. Um, and I think that that might actually be something that would be energizing for exciting, different, interesting, where we're not particularly trying to engage in dimensions where we are not, we don't have the ability um, to engage with the scientists. I mean, they have to do, they're doing their thing. What are we going to tell them to do um, at, this, um, at this point? But this might be something which is the power of movements. Um, and the, that might be something to consider, think about, that might excite the imagination of people um, to, if we can find very tangible ways of doing it. And I think if we think about it as dialogues, um, it might, be, it might be possible and very interesting to do. The urgency of this climate crisis, many member states maybe they didn't want to recognize. Um, they want maybe business as usual. And they also offer the false solution, like uh, bring the role of the private sector, you know, that you know, the corporates can provide the solution and all the funding to solve, to solve that problem. So all this um, debate and denial uh, was you know very difficult um, to push forward like uh, we're not even like holding the line I think it's kind of uh, in the, <laughs> that's uh, in the mood like we're holding the line if we not make progress at least we're not you know come, going going back turning back because my work is really grounded in the Pacific and in the Pacific you know we talk in terms of this being an existential crisis because some states will cease to exist you know as states um, and they don't want to leave where they live, although some have made some, you know, sort of contingent kind of plans for relocation if they have to, um, because relocation within their countries for these really low-lying yeah, states is impossible. Um, but in the Pacific, one of the things that's really concerning us at the moment is that you would think that in this present, you know, moment of this climate crisis, the last thing you'd be thinking about is trying to take, you know, what else you can from the earth, from the planet. Hmm? And yet deep sea mining is emerging as a, you know, I mean, it's the press, the push to deep sea mine is intensifying. And in the Pacific, it's where it's actually, this is kind of the front line of where DSM is the push for DSM is happening. Um, so, and, and ironically, and, you know, it totally, um, it, I mean, it's such a disingenuous thing. Ironically, they ha they, the, a particular mining company is linking 
climate change and the urgency of climate action to an urgency to deep sea mine. They're arguing that we need those base metals, yeah, on the seabed to, um, for green technologies, for, you know, battery driven cars, um, for your, um, for windmills or wind power, for um, your cell phones, your smartphones. It's a different reality that young people are living with. And so even when it comes, as I say, to climate change, um, and even if it looks utopian, I think it's the young people who will, if anybody can show us the way forward, it will be them. And one might say, oh my God, you know, how is it, what do you think really that they can withstand the power of corporations, the uh, production and consumption and system that is so out of whack with planetary boundaries? Um, do you really think they can? I believe yes, because I think I believe that we have done it before, that in fact, if, we, if I go back to my own lifetime, after all, the 1960s transformed the world, not in minor ways either. So I think human action comes from the imagination. And I think that, you know, there is an imagination there. Um, young people are always willing to put their lives where their imaginations are. They have nothing to fear in doing that, they don't fear in doing that. We never feared in doing that. We put our lives where our imaginations were and the world was transformed in many ways. That the power of, um, of uh, I don't know what to call them, the forces of reaction, the forces of um, capitalism um, is so great is nothing new. It's always been like that. Uh, and it always keeps reinventing itself. Um, but it also, but, um, uh, but as I suppose, as human beings, we don't give up. Um, as um, feminists, we certainly don't give up. Uh, and um, I don't think young people are gonna give up either. Thank you.